I try not to think about it a lot, how serious it really was. You know, if that boat hadn't come along when it did, the doctors told me, they said I was lucky enough to be alive as in the state that they found me. So if they said, you know, and never mind another half an hour in that water. It was just, uh, you know, yeah. I made it a focus of mine to start targeting stripers. And I spoke to the owner of the shop and talked about strategy. He told me where to go and told me, he said, I recommend getting a depth finder. You want to find where things drop off, things like that. I have a chart that a, an old gentleman gave me. He, we opened the charts up and he said, he said you got to keep on going. He said, I, he said, you're not far enough. He said, just keep going, just keep going. So we thought nothing of it, didn't think anything of the dangers of keeping on going. It was just, the focus was just to keep going, to find that 40 feet of water where that drop off was because that's where the stripers were at the time. I went directly to the boat launch and, uh, and I set off and I just put my head down and I was just paddling, paddling, paddling. I'm somewhere, again, I broke the 20 foot barrier of, of depth and I'm just plugging along and out of nowhere, I didn't see it, didn't, there was no warning, no nothing. I just, a big wave came from the side and rolled me over. And next thing I know, I was in the water. Something was floating nearby and I tried bailing it out, you know, frantically. And I, for every four scoops I would take of the coffee container sized item I had, a wave would come and would fill back up. Flip it over again. and again and again and it just kept flipping and nothing was happening it just kept would turn over it would be full of water and be sitting below the surface i don't know how much time had passed but i knew that it was starting to get very serious i'm not making any stride here i'm cold i'm burning energy um you know i need to make a decision here i just kept telling myself it's calm, be calm it's okay you know, I'm used to the bay where it's just a lot of activity. This was early in the season where there was no boats out there. And then, you know, there was fleeting moments of, uh, I guess, adrenaline rushes and just general frustration when I would just start screaming. I would be screaming like, I can't believe there's no boats out here anymore. Where are all the boats? And I would tell myself, calm down, calm down. I told myself, I said, I I'm not dying in the bay within miles of my own house. It was that and then the other half of me saying, don't give up. And I said, I'm not just gonna sit here. So I just kept flipping it over and flipping over and I kept blowing my whistle. I vaguely remember a sailboat coming around and I remember them throwing the life buoy to me and whatever. And then I don't remember anything after that. How you doing this evening? We just fished a uh, gentleman out of the water. He's on a kayak. Um, he's extremely cold with exposure to water for about five hours, over. It just caught my eye. I saw the green of his kayak upside down. Oh my gosh, there's somebody in the water. Turn, let's go. You know, we, we were like screaming. So we turned the boat really hard. The thing that struck me was he's in the water waving his arms and just that motion and seeing that through the binoculars. Holy moly, this guy's waving his arms just like they say you're supposed to. Mayday, 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 this is sailing vessel our diamond. And about that time I'd, you know, set the radio aside and turned around and Sean's still in the water holding onto the ladder. Essentially uh, grabbed him under the, the armpits and just lifted him up. Um, had him kneeling on the back of the boat. It's quite small back here. We heard that distress call come in from the sailboat and they were asking for assistance from the Coast Guard to get a kayaker in the shore quickly because they had just pulled him from the water and he was hypothermic. I looked up and there was only two other boats out there. There was only one sailboat at the mouth of the South River. So I said, Mark, uh, we're not fishing tonight. It took all of us to get him on the boat and he was uh, very lethargic, couldn't move. Mark and I knew we had needed to get him dry. He still had his life jacket on, blue jeans, t-shirt, got his wet clothes off, put a dry sweatshirt on him, kept saying, I'm cold. So it was kind of just weird being on top of somebody that you'd never met and you're like trying to keep him alive. And he's 
just and it all of a sudden it was just was nothing and you're like oh my god I mean you know how cold he's purple and like a color you've never seen on a human before you know it's like he's all crunched up and stiff and it was pretty intense to me Coast Guard, Roger Shine. I've got uh, Rose River Marina in sight. I see the uh, emergency unit there. The individual is conscious. He's in and out. He's in, he's in bad shape. He's going to need some attention. If they didn't find him when they did, once that son, you know, gets behind the trees, I don't think they would, they would have ever seen him. He would have hit shore eventually, but uh, in 47 degree water. I don't think he had another 15 minutes any. I know I made a mistake by underestimating that kayak and that it wasn't the correct vessel to be taking out on this bay, that it was more a recreational kayak. It should have been an inshore kayak. It was an open hole style that when rolled over, it could have it filled with water. I did not make any preparations to think of what could have happened if doing so. I just always assumed if the thing if it flipped over, I could flip it back over. I didn't ever thought about it filling up with water. That's the mistake that I feel that I made on my behalf was, you know, I underestimated the vessel itself. I feel very lucky without the life jacket. There was no way I could have even hung on to that kayak. Just wearing it absolutely kept me alive that long.